I'm excited to be part of this program with such distinguished guests. Patrick Dobard has been the superintendent of Louisiana Recovery School District since 2012. He oversees the district's 63 New Orleans charter schools, which educate some 33,000 students. The RSD became the nation's sole charter-only school district last summer when the last remaining district-run school was converted to charter. The recovery district was created by the Louisiana legislature to take over academically failing school districts. Post-Katrina, failing New Orleans schools were brought under the RSD, and Patrick Dobard is now changed, charged with leading those schools to success. A native of New Orleans, Mr. Dobard was raised by education-minded parents. His father was a self-employed electrician and part-time movie projectionist who moved his six children to private Catholic schools after losing faith in the New Orleans public school system. Mr. Dobard graduated from St. Augustine High School, then went on to get an education degree from Southern University at New Orleans. He taught for 10 years and earned a master's degree, then moved on to work at the State Department of Education, beginning a career focused on improving education outcomes by leading the administration of education delivery. Before becoming the RSD superintendent in 2012, he served as the district's deputy superintendent for community and policy. Please join me in welcoming Patrick Dobard. <laughs> Gloria Romero is an education reform leader on national thought on student achievement and independent schools. She's a former California state senator and served as the California Senate Majority Leader from 2001 to 2008. She was the first woman to hold that post. In 2008, she stepped down as the Majority Leader and became Chair of the Senate Education Committee. In that position, she authored and guided the passage of the Parent Trigger Law, which allows a majority of parents in failing schools to vote on a method for restructuring the school. Dr. Romero is a native of Barstow, California, also one of six children, like Patrick Dobard, her father worked in railroad yards, and her mother, who left school at sixth grade, stayed home to raise the kids. Dr. Romero started her post-secondary education at a community college, then went on to get a BA and an MA from California State University, Long Beach, and a PhD in psychology from the University of California, Riverside. She taught as a professor at state universities and served as trustee and vice president of the Board of Trustees of Los Angeles Community College District. Please join me in welcoming Gloria Romero. Before we get in, are these good? Okay. Before we get into the heavy stuff tonight, I know that you guys have been doing a little bit of traveling around our state and you went to a Blazer game last night. Have we converted you to Blazers fans? Lakers, <laughs> Clippers, but I loved the, the game. <laughs> Good. Okay. What about you? Um, I didn't make the game last night, but I am a diehard Lakers fan only because as a, uh, about, I guess I was about 10 or 11, the Jazz left New Orleans, uh -huh. and I was a fan-free agent, and I made a good choice, I think, and so I, I've been a Laker ever since. So another another commonality between you two. Okay. <laughs> right. All right. Well, Patrick, I want to start with you. The change in New Orleans is probably the boldest school conversion that has ever happened in this country. Can you give us an overview of how you made the Recovery School District become the nation's first all-charter district? How, how did you do it? Well, it's not like a me or I. And first, I just want to say thank you for having me here tonight. Thank you for um, Representative um, Julie Parrish, um, because without her, um, I wouldn't even have envisioned being in a place like this this evening. So thank you so much for your leadership. <laughs> and so it's, it's definitely not a me thing. It's a, it's a we, literally. We have a great team. And I think context is extremely important. And so in, in, in New Orleans, um, we had a, a system of schools before the storm that was just both um, just corrupt in a number of ways, not only morally corrupt with the indictment of several board members, but also um, just bankrupt in the sense, a financial sense, but also morally bankrupt in the sense of educating kids. And so what we've been able to do is to, to lead a system of schools that allowed us to take where 65% of schools in New Orleans were F schools in 2005 
Today, only 5% of schools are F schools. 23% of our students in 2007 were scoring at a proficient level on statewide assessments, today over 60%. The graduation rate has gone from around the mid-40s to almost 75% and so, in, in that same time frame. And so what, you know, what we've been able to do is to like, really focus on, and I think what happened was like Katrina was just a, a total catastrophe. I mean, it was unimaginable what happened. But in some sense, the storm, literally and figuratively, washed away institutional barriers. And so we really have an opportunity in, in, in a moment in time, and over almost it'll be the 10-year anniversary this August, um, you know, we've come, we're at a point now where we've seen like this tremendous academic growth. But I don't want to oversell anything, don't get me wrong. It's, it's, we're, we were awful, literally, before the storm. And now we're just getting to like good and now we're trying to figure out, right? And now we're trying to get, how do we go from good to like excellent? To where your choices are just a matter of about like, do I want a CTE program? And do I want blended learning versus, you know, right now, you know, folks are still just trying to feel out like what's the quality in the school. So I think it's a lot of, you know, just a lot of teamwork. I could talk more specifics about legislation and things that we've done to enable us. But I think, um, you know, just really the mindfulness of a team and really focusing on what's best for children. How did you get the community on board with this? Teachers, staff, parents, students? Well, I, th I think what happened right after the storm, um, the, the original intent was for the RSD, which again takes over chronically underperforming schools. So I want to make certain that you understand, like, the average student that is in a recovery school district school at its outset is usually two or three grade levels behind. And so when you think about it, a school to be eligible for the RSD, you have to be failing for four consecutive years, okay? Now think about your kids, if you have kids, or your family members, or people you care about. Would you want your 14-year-old to be in a school, 14, 15, 16, 17, graduate, and that school, then you're told, you know, you're not acceptable. You're not getting them to a level of proficiency. And so the state legislature, I think, was very wise in 2003 to create the entity to do that, to take over those chronically underperforming schools. 2005, it was a one fell swoop because of Katrina. And what happened was, there weren't any people back in the city. And then as educators started coming back, we were standing up charter schools. And then what happened was, we realized that creating an autonomous network of schools was what's going to be best for us to move forward with our system of schools. Like the old status quo wasn't able to be in place anymore. So initially, People felt like we did reform to New Orleans versus with New Orleans, and I would say that's true. And regretfully, in a sense, it almost had like an imperialist feel. Like, we're coming in, and we're going to tell you what's good for you, and we know what's good for you. But it was more because people were just trying to help and get schools stood up and wanting to do the right thing. And then now what we see is that, you know, almost seven years later, and 10 years after Katrina, is that we've become more mindful of how to bring community along with us to do this. So parents, their, their mindset has changed. They're now looking at the letter grade system and saying, no, I want to go to a D school or one of that 5% F schools. How do I get into A school? How do I get into B school? What do I have to do? Um, you asked in the, in the original question about how do we become our charter and what we were doing. Our goal was to just really empower leaders, and we never were envisioning ourselves as the RSD to direct run schools. So we always had a mindset that we were going to either phase schools out, that we were directly running and empower charter leaders, and build a network of charters that were going to be strong enough to maintain and run schools. And what it is now is that you know, each charter school, they're all public schools, obviously, and each have their own independent board. And so parents and educators, those closest to the children, are really much more involved in their lives. So you can imagine, instead of a school board that oversees 60,000 kids like it was before the storm, we have about 40,000 kids now, but they're all very sm like they're only a little small school district. So you might have a board of just 600 kids. So that's much more access for families. That's much more access for parents. That's much more access for communities. So the questions tend to be more localized because of your charter network, and I think that has allowed community involvement to go to a place that we didn't envision 10, 20, 30 years ago. And Gloria, excuse me. You have been a major advocate for charter schools throughout your career. Can you share with us some of um, the characteristics that charter schools have that public schools don't? Thank you, I will. And, and let me also congratulate and thank Representative Parrish. It's just been a real honor to get to know her. I think she's a kindred spirit in this fight for 
quality education, you know, to best for having the vision to put something like this together, the Portland Business Alliance. I really congratulate and salute you. And always, whenever I have a chance to sit and dialogue and listen to the superintendent, it, it reaffirms why, really, the nation's eyes. If you want to look at education reform and what we can envision, what we can imagine, it's, it's really what's happening in, in New Orleans. So thank you for being here and, and, and speaking. Charter schools, the way I look at it is, you know, and I've been a long fan of this, is you know, I often tease and I say, look, you know, I'm a Democrat. I actually am a pro-choice democratic woman. So that also means my child, my choice when it comes to education. Charter schools are public schools for the most part. They're public schools, but they allow choice. They allow portability. You know, if you stop and think about it, the way that we deliver education in most America is it's a notion based on feudalism. It's based on the land. It's based on really arbitrary boundaries of how school districts are somehow they come into being, and most parents have no idea, but some basically nameless uh, bureaucrat in the education bureaucracy looks at your address. You live here. You go there. And the thing with charter schools is that even when, I won't say if, because it's when, the state, whether it's Louisiana or Oregon or California, even when the state identifies that your school, your kid's school, our children's school, has been chronically underperforming, I will just say failing, year after year after year after year, you must stay there. No exit. That's not right. I represented East Los Angeles in the California State Senate. It's a civil rights issue. It's a civil rights issue. And, and so charter schools provide a choice option for parents for predominantly high poverty children of color, in particular, who are most likely to be affected by being trapped. And I will say literally trapped in a school with no way out. That is wrong. Where else in America do we tell people, you can't go to a park, you can't go to a church, you can't go to a shopping mall, you can't buy a house in a neighborhood because you live in this zip code and you must stay there. So the bigger issue, I think, is look, if every neighborhood school was functioning and highly performing, maybe we wouldn't need portability and charters. But we know that that's not the case. We find disparate impacts and the disparate delivery of quality of instruction, of opportunities. And so to me, I believe in charters because it's a choice. Uh, it allows me to vote with my feet. It allows the money to follow the child. It allows children, whether they are children of color or they're children of the affluent. Although if you're affluent, you have choice because it usually means money. But you shouldn't have to be rich to buy your way into the American dream. So that's why I am very fervent as a Democrat in understanding that when it comes to education, we should all just park our politics part, whether it's an R, a D, an I behind our name, and say we're in it to put kids first. And that does mean leading with trusting parents to truly become the architects of our children's educational futures. And that's having choice such as we have with charters. Obviously, there's the, ch the choice component um, involving charter schools. But how do charter schools actually work from the family perspective? And again, too, uh, with charters, you know, charter schools are, most people, and I heard Patrick talking earlier, if you were to look at it overall, probably most parents, you couldn't really decide which one's which. I mean, uh, a good, because you can have bad schools. But the thing is, with charters, if it's bad, they can be shut down. You know, five years, think about mortality. If somebody told you you have five years to live, how are you going to live your life? To a large extent, when a charter is given, an authorizer, like a local school district, somebody who puts it together, they give you a charter. There's a vision. It's basically saying the clock's running. You've got five years. 
there's accountability at the end. So a charter operates on the premise of accountability. In five years, I am going to accomplish X, Y, and Z. And then you have the barometer, you've got the data, you've got the metrics to be able to go back and to assess what was accomplished. Because if it's accomplished, then you can go ahead and reissue, renew the charter. Uh, I think bottom line is there's different charters. I've met many different charter operators. Depending upon what the needs are for your particular child, you can choose a particular path. But at the end of the day, we're looking at, I believe, a greater freedom and autonomy from most of our very Byzantine, very antiquated education codes. So charters are basically a permission to free oneself from the red tape, as Patrick has described, to be able to become basically petri dishes of education reform, quality of education, and then the charter is assessed. But usually I think it does mean you're freed from some of the very stagnant, you know, the minutia of the education codes, so you typically can get a very high quality, for example, teachers. Teachers are the leaders in a charter school, but it usually means then that you have a, a higher bar for the retention and the promotion of the teachers who deliver education. There's just freedom, and we value freedom. Patrick, you've already addressed a little bit about how that freedom has impacted the students and families in your state. Um, what has been the primary driver of the success of the charter system in New Orleans? Um, I think it's, it's a few things. Um, first of all, we have, one, a quality authorizing process. You have to go through a rigorous process to be approved as a charter school in Louisiana. So the, the, it, you can be authorized either by the local school board, um, the RSD is by the state, the state school board, and we bring in an inter independent entity such as the National Association of Charter School Authorizers. We use SchoolWorks right now, who's an independent entity that reviews charter applicants. They screen them. Then they make recommendations to us, which we ultimately make a recommendation to the state to get them started. And so you have to have an established board. You have to have financials in order and just be totally ready and green-lighted to run a school. Um, secondly, what's allowed the schools to also be um, extremely successful is our accountability system. You know, as, um, Dr. Romero pointed out, is that schools are under contracts. And so basically, they're on the clock once we sign them up to, to have the privilege. It's not a right, it's a, it's a privilege to educate our young people. And so once they get this privilege, they're supposed to meet certain targets. And for their first renewal in five years, you got to go from an F to a D. And then if you're going for your second renewal, you got to go from a D to a C. And there has not been one school in the, in the years since the RSD has been in existence that if you have not met that bar, that we've kept in, in, in operation. And so the accountability system is like, it is like what holds schools to that level, to that threshold. Thirdly, what makes it really work well is the autonomy that we give school leaders. So those closest to the children are making decisions about those children. And so our school leaders, they control their budgets. They get the exact same funding as any other public school in Louisiana. So they get no more, no less. <laughs> We, we charge a very small administration fee of about 2.75%. I understand here it's almost 20%. But we want schools to be able to function and thrive. And so it's not about, about, it's, it's not about anything other than giving them that space to be able to do everything they can in order to be successful. And also what's allowed it to work is that we're, we're, we play the role of what we feel government should be in a decentralized system. And what that means is we ensure equity within our system of schools. So all of the schools that are under the RSD in New Orleans are in a common enrollment system. So there's no pushing kids out. We have to serve all kids. The Recovery School District School has over 12% special ed students across the board. We have a higher percentage of special education students in all Recovery School District schools. So we don't cherry pick. You can't cherry pick. In actuality, we non-renewed the charter that was a C school up for their second renewal last week. And I made a recommendation to the state board because we got a, a whistleblower that showed us over a few months how they were violating SPED, um, the IDEA law, and we shut that down. And it's because you have, a, you have a responsibility to serve kids. And so in our equity initiative, we're making certain that we allow schools to help become better. And our school leaders, they work together in order to solve solutions together, to have solutions together. So we had a problem with expulsions. So the school leaders got together and said, look, our expulsion policies are all over the place. 
You're putting the kid out for possession. You're putting the kid out for getting high. Maybe we need to tear the offenses. Because if a kid's coming to school high, that's a much deeper emotional issue that he might be having where he's trying to escape something. And we need to keep him in school rather than putting him out of school. So what our school leaders decided to do was we created a common expulsion hearing office to make sure everyone was following their expulsion process. So the schools that had high expulsion rates last year, some of them were ridiculously high. Today, one of those networks, they have zero expulsions this year. They put a restorative justice program in place, and it's just been totally, it's totally transformative. And I say that because our school leaders tend to be more solution-oriented for the system because they know the benefit for them is benefit, really should benefit the whole. So we often sacrifice of self to think about the collective good. And then I think that the last thing that makes it work is, is the choice element. So we live and breed the three-sector approach in New Orleans. And what that is is that you have traditional public schools still run by the local school district. They have about nine schools. You have the majority of schools in New Orleans, which is almost like 90% of the market share are charter schools. And then we also have students that receive vouchers, scholarships, that, that's public dollars but go to the public schools, I mean private schools. And they're held accountable to the same accountability system to make sure we're using dollars well. And so I always say it's redefining what public education is. It's the public's education system. And so when we say public education, everybody immediately thinks of something in their mind. You have a vision. And for us, what makes New Orleans so different is that we embrace the three-sector approach. We have, you know, again, rigorous um, authorizing. We have autonomy. We have accountability. And then we have lots of choice. And I think that's what's allowed us to be um, just like innovative. Uh, we're not, again, we're no magic solution or magic elixir. Nothing special, but just the infrastructure that allows us to, to run schools in a way that hasn't been seen yet in this country. What have you noticed about family involvement uh, with these charter schools? Are families more involved, are guardians more involved, parents, with their kids because their, their students are in these essentially um, mini school districts within the larger school district? Yes, you tend to see more involvement, but a lot of it comes around like the network of schools. But quite honestly, the involvement is a bit more, but not at the level it needs to be. So if you have like KIPP schools, which has about nine schools in New Orleans, you know, they might have a really good turnout of, let's say, maybe, a, you know, 100 parents um, just across the network for their different parent meetings. But when you think that they serve maybe about like two or 3,000 kids, that's a very small number. And we have to keep in mind, particularly in New Orleans, many of our parents and grandparents were educated in a woefully inadequate public school system. So they're working two jobs. You know, we're a big service industry, industry city. They don't have a lot of time to be able to go and do things in schools. So our educators don't just lean on the fact, well, we need more parental involvement to get our kids where they need to get to. Our educators realize that you got to be mama and daddy, you got to be grandpa sometimes, and you got to be teacher. Because we go above and beyond because we know that a lot of our kids don't have that stability at home. And so they just, they just jump in and fill in the gaps. We continue to try to encourage parents. We have great partners um, like Stand for Children and different organizations that continue to try to help, but that's more of a larger systemic problem that we have. So we don't make the excuse of lack of parental involvement. We just say we're going to continue to work towards increased parental involvement. Gloria, what has happened in, in New Orleans is so unique at this point. Um, not many urban school districts, I think, would be willing to take on something like this. How do you see the mix of charter schools and traditional public schools? What should that mix look like? And I think we're fooling us if we think that um, we've got to wait for a Hurricane Katrina to hit our state. You know, in California, most likely we're not going to have the hurricane, but our children, thousands of children, they're already underwater. And so I think the issue is basically just having the courage to do the right thing for kids, to park the politics, to understand, yeah, maybe campaign contributions flow from particular, you know, the alphabet soup of special interests in the education monopoly, because it exists. I was the majority leader and the chair of the education committee. I've been in all those back rooms. And I can tell you, I used to see all the little school children come into the Capitol. They would take the lovely tour about government and how laws are written, and I used to think, all right, little children, you want to really see how it's done? Come to the back room with me, okay? It ain't a pretty picture. It ain't a pretty picture. 
so, so I look at it, and, and that's where I go back and I think, you know, again, too, if, if all the schools were functioning, great. We wouldn't be sitting here talking about choice and charters and pilots and, you know, anything we imagine. But the reality is we have stark, stark achievement gaps. And they're not just high poverty and minority children. I mean, you're talking also about a lot of white children, middle class children. Our schools are not as good as we think. And then we're not competing just with each other. It's not, not just New Orleans versus L.A. We're talking about the world, India, Russia, China. It's a global economy. And so, you know, if we rest on our laurels and we think, well, our schools are good, we're basically, as Patrick says, we're playing each other. But we are in a glo It ain't feudalism anymore, remember? So that model, let's get rid of it. Let's think of something more imaginative. So I look at this and I think I understand that the traditional district schools, understandably, they're going to resist. And power never cedes power without a fight. It's a civil rights issue that applies to all of us. Districts, you know, God bless them, but, you know, sometimes it's about the money and children are treated like debit cards. You know, but in seat, that calculates to how many dollars, uh, you know, on a, daily, uh, on a daily basis. If you're the parent at one of those schools, where it's been on the program improvement list for 10, 12 years, that's not good enough. These are our kids. And so I look at it and I think I believe in a healthy competition. If we just let status quo and monopoly exist, we're never going to be challenged. We're never going to challenge ourselves to be imaginative and to do better for ourselves. It's kind of like, you know, our muscles basically just atrophying and then we die, you know? So I think it's important to have that healthy competition, to push ourselves to, you know, sort of like, let me help you, you know, do the right thing. And, I, and that's what I see in charters, having a choice and giving that choice to the parents who pay the taxes, send their children to the schools. I mean, really, it's the parents who should have the freedom and the right to make the choice what kind of a school, traditional, online, virtual homeschooling, you name it. I mean, there's room for all of it. You know, if we can walk and chew gum at the same time, we can deliver education in a multiplicity of ways that works for kids first. But we have to have courage as adults, I think, to recognize it's a public education system, not a public works program for the adults. It's public education. I want to touch on something you said there at the end. School choice is not just about charter schools. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, again, too, I mean, uh, as, as Patrick mentioned as well, too, school choice, even some folks say, okay, if I choose to keep my child in the traditional neighborhood school, that's a choice. If I want to go online, if I want to homeschool, if I want to go ahead, as you have in Louisiana with the special opportunity scholarships, the voucher program, I'm not afraid of that in terms of looking at where we move public money because public education to me, it's not about brick and mortar, it's what you do with the public dollars. It really is re-envisioning what, as Patrick has pointed out, what do we mean by public education? You know, the charter schools, and then there's a whole array and variety of them. Uh, for me in California, when I wrote laws and pushed open enrollment, the Parent Empowerment Act, it was giving parents the choice to be responsible to not only be involved, but to be empowered to make the right choices for their children. You know, I'd always hear, oh, those parents don't care about their kids. And then when those parents step up to do the right thing and say, we're going to turn around this failing school, all of a sudden they're like, get back. Like, you can't be here. So I think choice means so many things, and I don't think we should be afraid of choice. It, it, it's something to, that I think makes us better. And even for the traditional model, if you're a fan of the traditional brick and, and, and mortar uh, model, choice and knowing that there's competition, knowing that somebody can leave and take their dollars and their kids with them, you're going to try to attract them, turn around a good product to keep them in that system. I'd like for both of you to take a, a stab at this next question. But Gloria, you mentioned um, the civil rights component of this. What should education leaders and political leaders be doing to address education access as a civil rights issue? 
you know, um, at the time that I was the chair of the Education Committee, I was also the chair of the Prison Reform Committee in California. And so I have been in virtually every prison in California for nothing that I myself have done. Just want to make that clear. And I believe in personal responsibility, but 70% of inmates in California do not have a high school diploma. It was a fast track from East LA to the big house. And we spend, I mean, enormous amounts of money for our juvenile injustice system, over $200,000 to incarcerate youth who then graduate, basically they're trained gladiators to go to the big house. It doesn't work. I was working the back end. This is what happens, and I would say if we don't educate, we will incarcerate. And so I left the majority leader's office. I left the plush leadership office. I was tired of those back rooms. I was tired of seeing the sausage being made. And I said, I'm going to take up the education chair. We have strong chairs in California, and I want, to, I want to write this. But I saw, and I joined by my side when I wrote the Parent Empowerment Act, was Alice Huffman. Alice Huffman, you have to invite her. She is the statewide director of the NAACP. The little secret is she used to be an organizer with the California Teachers Association, who, by the way, is the most important political money special interest in California. They spend more than alcohol, tobacco, and pharmaceuticals combined. And for purposes of full disclosure, I'm a member of the CTA, but I'm one of those members who pays my union dues and then says, my money's going to fight everything I believe in. So, you know, Alice and I went to the legislature. We, we, uh, all you have to do is look at the data. I mean, Patrick talked about the, the rates of proficiency, the lack of graduation, the incarceration rates. Uh, and we look at it, California today, it's a majority-minority school district. You know, over 50% of the kids in California in the public school system are Latino. Two-thirds are children of color. And it's going to continue because we are a very diverse America. And so I think that it's important to recognize, you know, even in, in how contracts are drawn up and the, you know, the dance of the lemons. I mean, this system of basically it's just if, you, if you're alive, you get promoted and you go, move forward, whether you're actually teaching or not. And so I do believe in merit. I think I'm worth it. And if you believe that you're worth it, then pay me for what I'm worth. Recognize me for what I'm worth. Don't just put me on a clock, last hired, first fired. Because typically you'll find that, you know, the system is set up in a way, and we had the Vergara lawsuit in California. It's now being challenged in New York. You should invite it here in Oregon if it's appropriate to you. That you're able to game the system so that the most qualified teachers are basically able to bypass, you know, those kids. And those kids are our kids. They're, they're our kids. And so, you know, when you look at it, I think it's important. You know, as, again, Joe, I always go back as a Democrat, because oftentimes I think, especially members on my side of the aisle, my party often said, well, that's a Republican idea. No, it's not. I mean, I go back and I take a look. Look at John F. Kennedy. In my household, we had pictures of JFK, you know, hanging in our house. John F. Kennedy, please, your homework, go back and take a look at his position on vouchers, special opportunity scholarships. I mean, Bill Clinton is the one, President Bill Clinton is the one who opened up the door to charter schools nationally. Teddy Kennedy, the lion of the Senate, the bluest of the blues of overall, he's the one who worked with George W. Bush to bring forth No Child Left Behind. And even if we can argue about NCLB, what it did, it opened up the books. It forced us to look at the numbers. You couldn't hide the statistics. I have a PhD. Data matters. We shouldn't be afraid of it because the numbers, as Patrick pointed out, they tell the story. They tell the story, and when you start seeing it, that's when you can see the inequities. But inequities need not stay if we have the courage and the vision and the practitioners like Patrick is doing and Kaylee has done to basically um, open up and really run alternative choice options that meet the, raise the bar so you don't have a soft bigotry of low expectation for anyone in our, in our uh, states. Patrick? Yeah, so, you know, we were recently accused of not serving all kids and 
you know, um, basically had like, is this a, a complaint filed and look into it. And we wrote a response back to the feds and it, you know, our main thing was around like if any entity in Louisiana has done anything for the civil rights of kids, it's been the recovery school district. And I think it is more than urgent that we really see this as a civil rights um, issue of our era, um, particularly because when children are not receiving a quality education, particularly kids that are f coming from poverty, and particularly minority students, that that's that right denied. And I'll just give a personal example, because I think Gloria said it all, she said it very well. But around 2002, I guess it may have been around that time, 2003, I was working with a youth choir um, at, at our church, a, a church that my wife and I were attending at the time, and I'm no singer. Um, I just, it's it the young people, I like to work with them. And there was this one young girl, she was 11 at the time, and every time we would give her the lyrics to a new song, she wouldn't read it. She would just kind of stand there and wait till we played the music and she'd listen and she'd learn the words just by listening to it. And one day her grandmother came to me and said, Patrick, uh, you know, would you help tutor my granddaughter? And I was like, oh yeah, sure, great. You know, I would definitely do it, you know, we'd get together. So. Uh, me and a young girl got together, and I asked a friend of mine that was working with me at the Department of Education, I said, would you come and give her a Dibbles assessment? So it's a, it's a literacy assessment, just to see what her reading level was, so I could, knew what, I could have an idea of what to do. And when we gave her the Dibbles assessment, this child was 11 years old, and she was reading on the fifth grade level. I'm sorry, on the five-year-old level, the kindergarten level. She's 11 and reading at the level of a five-year-old. And it, it still hurts me today, I get emotional about it. Because as I dug in, I found out that she had an IEP. It wasn't even written to like any standard that was like correct. I mean, they had her trying to do things that was at what an 11 year old was doing. And I was like, wait. And what made it worse is that one of the church members that was like really like very active in my church was the principal of our school. And I had just got into the Department of Ed, and I just had access to power, and I just started working with the legislature. And what that did was it fueled in me and said, you know what, it's not about being in power, one word in, another word power, it's about empowering, okay? And I said, well, I have this moment and have people around me, I gotta keep her in mind. Because this young lady was failed by the system and then it hit me even harder when I started thinking, how many more thousand kids are like her in Louisiana? Bad IEPs, she's 11 in the wrong grade, she can't read. I mean, we was like trying to like sound out cat. I was like, come on baby, cat. And I'm sitting there crying, she's crying one day, and I remember I would say, I'm gonna give you your first little test. And we got like 20 words or 30 words she had, we were working on. And I said, number your paper, one through 30. And she said, one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine. She got to nine and she paused. And I said, 10. And then she went 11, 12, 13, 16, and she got to 19. And I said, 20, and then it hit me like a ton of bricks. I said, this child doesn't understand concepts of 10. And then I started crying again because I was like, she don't know math. She doesn't know science. She can't do social studies. She can't read. Now, if that's not a civil rights issue, then I'm sorry, people, there's no, I don't know what is. And so for me, it's about those real moments where we're either going to be definitely like true warriors about what's, what we believe in, or we're just going to sit back and just com keep complaining and tell everybody about all the ills. You know, I always would tell the critics, and I tell them today, I know what you're against, but what do you stand for? And I'm standing for children, like the young girl that was at my church, to make sure that now it's not a right denied. And unfortunately, a, a, about a year or so ago, a, a, a common friend died at, at church, and we got together for a funeral, and she's like, I guess in her, um, you know, she's like early 20s now, whatever, and I asked the grandmother what she's doing, and she's an aide in a cafeteria. And I didn't even have the heart to be like, did she even graduate? Did she ever get on level? Because we kind of lost touch. And then again, I keep thinking like, how many more thousand in Louisiana? And y'all having me up here, I'm like, how many more thousands around this country? Millions. So this is not a game. This is not something to take lightly. And so the, so the question shouldn't be, is this a civil rights issue? The question should be, why aren't more people outraged about this civil rights issue that we have to address?
Patrick, Gloria uh, brought up unions uh, a couple minutes ago. How do charter schools work with teachers' unions? Well, in Louisiana, we don't have, like, like collective bargaining. It's a right to work. And so, um, <laughs> and it, it never was, like, really, it's not, it's not an impediment. So we did have one charter that decided to unionize a couple of years ago. And it's, it's not a problem from the way that they're operating. But one of the biggest things is that it hasn't been able to have, like, a foothold in Louisiana because it never was, like, something that was strong really before the storm. And so I think our school leaders, they're really, like, setting the market. So they, they, get to, they get to determine salary ranges. So they're competing. So if Kip's offering a certain salary and Inspire Nola wants to do something, they, they realize they have to be creative. Um, our teachers, they don't have to be in the teacher's retirement system for Louisiana, which has been like liberating to where schools can offer more money and say, hey, you can get your own insurance, uh, you know, your own retirement plan and, and invest your money yourself. So to give people options instead of saying you have to be in something, give people options. And so the unions have not been anything that has been able to like get in the way of the progress. And I understand, but like when I come to places such as Oregon and I go to New York and different places, I see how that institution is so strong. And what I always do is just what I just said. It's like, to those leaders, I always just pose to them. I know what you're against, but what do you stand for? Let's start working towards those things that are gonna really move the lever for kids. That's not gonna be about adults. Cause you could sit here and point fingers at us all day long. We're doing the work. We're not just theoreticians, we're practitioners. And so we're like in here. It's like, um, there's a, a lady named Brene Brown and she's got a book called Daring Greatly. And she talks about the Roosevelt like being like in the arena. Like we're in the arena. We got the tears, the blood, the sweat, and everything else. So if the unions want to get in there with us with that, then just come on, let's get in there. Because it's not about whether we win or lose. It's about that we were part of it and that we're in it. And so in Louisiana, it's just a little bit different. I know in Los Angeles, you know, the unions is almost everything. And I know here in Oregon, it's like very powerful. But I think it's about educators even holding the unions themselves accountable to say, you know what, like your, our existence may have been for something that was like 40, 50, 60 years ago, but this is a different time. And the value I need you to bring for me now is based on this and this. I want equity in my classrooms. You know, I want to be, <laughs> I want to be treated as the professional I am, but it doesn't have to be just on years of experience. It, it can be on just talent and merit. Because as I was giving the example about the young lady at my church and I thought about that principal, I said, you know what, if this was any other profession, you know, teachers and that principal would lose their license for malpractice. You know, that is like a malpractice issue when you have children that's not on level like that. So for me, that's to me what the union should be advocating for. And how can we make sure that all of our professionals are serving kids well and then moving that lever. And so in Louisiana, it hasn't been a deterrent, um, but at the same time, you know, I know that those undercurrents are always quite there, so we're not, like, naive, and we're just going to continue to push forward and really try to do what's best for kids. Gloria, what do you have to add to that? Uh, you know, in California, charter schools can be unionized. Uh, but again, too, it's the choice of the teachers that are there. Uh, I also think, too, that, you know, some unions can choose to open up and run their own pilot schools. They've tried that in Los Angeles. New York, actually, the... Uh, United Federation of Teachers, they actually had a charter school. They just rather very quietly shut it down just in the last few days because it didn't meet the marker overall. They called it originally it was going to be an oasis. It turned out to be a mirage, as Larry Sands said. <laughs> so, you know, and I look at it, and I will say, though, that it's not just in California, it's not just the teachers' union. You also deal with, you know, I call it basically the brotherhood, the sisterhood because it'll be the classified, it'll be the others. When I was running legislation in Sacramento, I'm a runtime, I was trying to get a bill passed. And at this time, it was a very modest version of what I ultimately got to basically name the 10 worst schools in California, and we were gonna turn them around. We were gonna invest resources. There was a line of opposition. I mean, it snaked out the committee room. And I'm listening, and there was such a long line, you know, they were behind me speaking where the microphone was. I remember hearing, and we are the Southern California Lifeguards Association in opposition. And I had to turn, I didn't even know the lifeguards had a union, but they found their way to Sacramento that day to argue against my little bill, and of course it was killed in committee. So very strong. I'm open to collective bargaining. Like I said, I'm a union member, but I'm one of the members who believes in democratic unionism 
Democratic with a small d, where as a member, where my dues go, I have a choice. And most of the time, I find my dues going to support the causes and the candidates against what I believe in and contrary to a civil rights movement. I think this is really a challenge for any of the, you know, and I know there are, you know, I mean, union friendly, union members perhaps in the room, but if unions want to survive in education, I mean, we're at a tipping point. It is really, I, I think it's come to the head in this nation to really decide truly, you know, like again, you know, brother, which side are you on? And to be in education, I think it means to provide education and to have the types of conditions that really tip the, the scale in favor of moving the bar, for moving the arc of justice forward, moving our schools forward. Because the kids that are in them are the kids who are really the most need of having allies to fight for education and change that reflects uh, uh, you know, a civil rights agenda. Let's talk about one bill that you did get passed. I wonder which one. <laughs> the, uh, the parent trigger law passed in California, eventually passed in Louisiana. How does it work and how is it benefiting uh, kids? Okay. And this was a law that actually, I remember telling myself, I shouldn't have had to write this law. Because there are federal laws. There were state laws. The law that I wrote, the Parent Empowerment Act, popularly referred to as Parent Trigger, actually has two legs to it. One part is open enrollment, the other part was Parent Trigger. We'll focus on Parent Trigger. But what I did was I would see, as you know, Chair of Education Committee, the lists, and they were just lists. I mean, you'd see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds representing thousands of kids in California on this list of failing schools. And nothing was ever done. It was just the list. And so I remember thinking, again, these are my kids. And even if they're not my kids, who's going to pay Social Security? Who's going to get the jobs? Who's going to be able to make the economy thrive if you, don't, if you can't read? And so I basically said, OK, if you, school board members, teachers, superintendents, principals, if you are not going to use the laws on the books, to turn around failing schools, then basically, pardon my French, get the hell out of our way. And I'm going to give the right to the parents. And if you stop and think about it, you know, it, I think this is the foundation of our democracy. It's we the people, we the parents. We have a right to petition our government. When our elected officials do not do what's right and good for us, then we the people have the right to turn things around and to take it into our own hands. So what I did was basically give the right to the parents, the most American of concepts, a petition where you could sign your name. And if you got 50% plus one, a democracy, of the parents to turn around that school, then the parents had the right to say, no more, no mas, this is not going to be a failing school. We are converting it because you have it. And we can choose under the parent trigger law to convert it transformationally as a charter, an independent public charter. Or you could do one of the other uh, changes like change the staff, shut it down, or to change the principal. That's how it works. And to date, this was a little law. The Wall Street Journal, actually, when I first wrote the law, they said, this is the most revolutionary law you've never heard of. And 20 state legislatures have debated this. I think seven or eight states have adopted some version of the law. It's an empowering law that says we're not afraid of our parents. We are going to give to our parents the right to say when your own officials won't use the laws to turn around a failing school, to change a failing school, to not keep them trapped and to promote generational poverty because they cannot read or do math, and then we send them to prison because the elected officials won't act. The, we the people, we the parents have the right to. The education bureaucracy didn't like it. They fought it. I could show you the marks on my back. I carry the wounds. But I'm very proud of this little piece of legislation that has stimulated a national conversation, debate, controversy, because it is imaginative. It thinks outside the box. It gave a seat at the table to parents, not to show up at the bake sale, not to just be involved, but a right, a real right to say, my child, my choice, with my little John Hancock, 
joining with other parents in a very American tradition, we have the right to turn the school around. It's a very simple idea. How often has it been used? It's been used now. Okay, the bill is, uh, the law was signed five years ago, really in operation four years. Right from the get-go, the first parents over in Compton, California, uh, predominantly African-American, Latino community, it was fought right from the start by the education, you know, status quo, uh, went to court. It was done in Atalanto. We want a big victory there. Just recently, in the shadow of Disneyland, you know, we have a dream. These parents dreamed also, and they've uh, triggered change. The education bureaucracy is fighting it. We will go to court. We want to expand it as a bigger civil rights fight. I urge you to take a look at it. Others have looked at it in Los Angeles, for example, removing a principal, doing some recomposition. Some parents in Pomona actually said, we're going to do the petition to basically leverage. You know, they didn't have to go to the back rooms in Sacramento. They figured it out. If we unite, it's like a parents' union, we're going to go ahead. They talked to the principal, the superintendent in Pomona, the superintendent understood it and said, hey, you know what, let's negotiate. What do you want? So it was constructive dialogue overall. So I'm very proud of this law, and I'm always excited when I hear different states adopting a version of this little law that was written in California. And I want to give Patrick a chance to talk about how this is working in Louisiana. Yes, no school is actualized on it yet, but I actually just saw yours in the, in the periodical, and. I remember giving it to a legislator, and he was like, he's actually the chair now of um, the House Education Committee, and he, as soon as he saw it, he barely got halfway through it, and he was following the bill. It's like, oh, we got to do this, so um, thank you for doing that. And so it's on the books in Louisiana. No one has used it yet. And even our opponents filed a reverse parent trigger bill, and they got it passed, and so you can get out of RSD if you want, and nobody's used that one yet. So um, you know, they're there, they're on the books. I think they're, they're good, both good vehicles. I like the concept of both, actually. And one is if a school, that we raise the threshold a little bit, it's not just F schools, it's DNF schools and parents can trigger in. And if you get out of that um, you know, DNF threshold, then you can trigger out. So it works both ways. Well, thank you both for answering my questions. And we have a few minutes. We want to take some questions from the audience. Sandy's going to help me out with the mic here. Okay. Thank you. I have to stand up? Okay. And, First, introdu and introduce yourself. Uh, uh, my name is Rob Kramer, and I've been involved in charter school uh, battles for a long, long time here in the state of Oregon. Currently, I actually am a vice president of government relations for a national virtual school provider that has schools in both California, three in California, and one in Louisiana. So, but I grew up in Oregon and have fought many battles here. And first, I'd like to thank you both for coming here and giving us this inspirational message of what is actually possible in education. So thank you. <laughs> Oregon is a state that in many respects is very, very smug about itself. But one thing it has no right to be smug about is its performance in its public school system. You've probably seen all of the metrics about our graduation rate and our achievement gap and our achievement scores, and we have no reason to be proud of the state of our public school system. And so we could really use some advice from both of you. In Oregon, the school choice battle, the charter school battle, tends to be a one-party issue. You're both from blue states. In one state, the slate was wiped clean, basically, and you were able to start afresh. And in another, glorious. You have built this from within the state in another blue state. So we could do some advice on how to bring the other party along, how to make this argument so that we can appeal to a broader constituency and a broader political power base in order to advance this cause. Again, too, it, it's a very good question, I think, and a challenge. I mean, the way that I always put it out is that it's important to park our politics, I mean, just to leave the party labels behind. And I know that's very difficult to do, uh, but it can be done. I think it is working across the aisle. I think it is, you know, a, as a Democrat, and I think that, quite frankly, you talked about the other party, it's my party. We all say the elephant in the room is really a donkey. It's us. <laughs> that's kind of like stymieing school choice and charter schools. I, I always go back and I point out, look, Bill Clinton. I mean, he's been the champion for charter schools. Every major piece of enabling legislation to create the charter laws 20 years ago 
were written by Democrats in the House, whether I think here in Oregon, California, I think Minnesota. So we take a look at it, and I think it's not about it's not about how we tether ourselves to a particular special interest, because that exists. But it's having the courage to acknowledge that and then to say, I'm going to put a kid's first agenda. And it's not easy to do. And it does mean you've got to cross party aisles, you've got to link arms, and you've got to say, together, we are going to make the change. Because sort of having this blind allegiance to special interest, because that's how the money flows, it's not doing much for the future of our states and the future of our nation. And until we have the courage to join together, we're going to be in a sad shape. I mean, like I say, we're, we're underwater as it is. And we just have to have the, the sense to recognize it and find our way out. I have another question over here. Oh, uh, do you have something to say? I, I have a question. So oh, no, you go ahead. That's fine. Oh, okay. Uh, I just want to welcome two of you to Oregon. I normally am the one with 10 questions. I have zero. But I, 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 I just want to thank you because this issue um, impact minority kids. This is for us and the League of Minority Voters. One of the challenge we face is the interest of the union. And this is the state when fighting for the life of bald eagle draw more attention than the life of minority kids. So within that mix, education get lost, substance get mixed. So I, I just want to thank you and to say that June 25th, the League of Minority Voters would love to bring you back to start this debate again. Thank you. I have no question. Hi there. Thank you for coming. I'm Representative Jody Hack, and I'm on the Education Committee. And my question is um, around the unions and the charter schools. So if a union is able to be a part of the charter school, are they then able to do collective bargaining? Not in Louisiana. It, it may. That's a good question. I would have to actually like check to see to be certain. But I don't think they would be able to. And I think the biggest thing, and it's all, it's, I'm struggling with the union questions because it is just really not strong in Louisiana. But I think, and this might be a bit, I guess I don't even know if it's too hopeful or too Pollyannish, but I think if there's a way for like elected officials to, if they're going to be funded by like the union and, and, and that special interest, to maybe get to a point where, you know, it's not about just that interest, but about, look, this is what I believe we should be doing, and I won't accept your funds, I won't accept your, your support, because this is what I firmly believe we should be doing. And in Louisiana, we weren't able to get the reform movement done without the help of cross the aisle politics. And so it was Democrats and Republicans, and the beauty of it was, it was just people coming around what they actually believe was best for kids. And so for me, I, you know, I grew up in a Democratic household, but sometimes if you just take away the party names and you look at platforms, like we got like strict Republican values in my house. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, wait a minute. And so I think we, gotta, we, tr we just have to try to figure out an education. I felt like it's the, one of the most bipartisan er er areas. You know, I was saying if you would have took former President Bush's agenda and put it next to President Barack's education agenda and you took away their names and their parties, they're like almost lockstep. And so I can sit with, um, you know, Governor Jeb Bush and totally philosophically be there with him where I feel like I am the majority of the time, as well as the same thing as what the president is doing, as well as like what we're doing in Louisiana. And I don't feel like I ever compromise. And I think sometimes, particularly with Democrats, I sit down and say, look, it's almost like you're just walking the party line, but what do you really, again, I keep saying this, what do you really believe in? What do you really believe in? Do you really believe kids can learn at higher levels? Yes. Do you really believe empowering leaders and teachers so they can serve those kids closest to them? Yes. Well, you just told me that you believe in what the basic constructs of charter schools are. And then you like, to me, it's like walk them through it. And you have to walk people through it and take that time. And I think particularly in public schools, and I think particularly in the South, 
there's a lot of distrust because what happened, um, particularly coming out of like as far back as the Civil War, it's for, coming out of Reconstruction. I always tell people, like particularly black Southerners and poor whites in the South, you know, the, the planter aristocracy wanted to be able to keep the structure that they had in place. So therefore, education was an area where they knew if the resources weren't put there, folks were going to be behind. So I always say, like, you know, our, our quality of our poor students, arguably in the South, is way behind poor students elsewhere in the nation because of where you got to start from. And so the thing is, it's like when you start breaking it down to folks like that and you move away from conspiracy theories, you move away from, like, just really wanting to get reelected, and you really start focusing on, like, you know what, at the end of the day, if I have any, like, just values, what I really am willing to go to bat for, like, what, what is it worth? You know, for some of you, it's natural resources. You know, darn it, don't touch my trees. Or, I got to cut more trees. I got to cut more trees. Whatever side you're on, some of you all will what? It, a lobbyist couldn't pay you enough money, or a union couldn't pay you enough money to not fight or to fight for your trees. And all I'm saying is, in education, it could be. My man was sitting next to me. But what could be is that. <laughs> And Trees I mean that, are a difficult but I mean subject because, here. Because, and, and the reason I say that is because there are so many people who just never take that stance in education. You go to these other committees, man, they're like, you're like, dang, they're like rabbit up in here. But when it comes to education, it's easy to say no. It's easy to say no. It's easy to say no. And so, well, good. I want you to be. And so I, I hope that helps answer this. It's a complicated one because where we stand with the unions, but I just feel like you got to pull, pull at that heart. Yeah. You might have to change that. <laughs> Let me just add, in California, uh, unions can organize. And in fact, the Green Dot Network in California is actually a union charter. I think the, uh, the difference, though, is take a look at the contract. Uh, UTLA, United Teachers of Los Angeles, which is, represents Los Angeles Unified, it's a voluminous document. Uh, and again, you basically can't do anything. The Green Dot contract is one where, I think it's, what, 10, 15 pages at most. You can get through it, very sensible, recognizing a number of issues. So I think that's part of it is when you're freed from some of the minutiae of the education code, freed from the red tape, you can be a lot more creative. And what we find is that rank-and-file teachers actually are not the same as the executive boards that make the political decisions. And most rank-and-file teachers really do say there's dead weight up there. You can't just breathe and get promoted. I mean, count us, and it shouldn't just be last in, first out. So there are real, I think, challenges within unions, and that's why I say it's democratic unionism. The members are speaking up themselves. We have another question in the back. Uh, Eric Sherman, my question is to uh, test the boundary of what you meant by autonomy. Do either of you support charter schools opting out of Common Core? No, we don't, we don't, do we support it or do we have any? Do or do we support, no, no. Do you support it? No, none of our charters in New Orleans and none of the charters statewide are, are opting out of Common Core. Um, they, they're actually embracing it um, because it's more about the depth and not just the breadth. And they're actually looking forward to assessments because that's an opportunity to show how much their children have learned. So I, I had a question. Uh, I haven't had a ch chance to learn a lot about uh, what you're doing in Louisiana, so I appreciate you being here and uh, telling me more. And so for me, I'm going to ask a hypothetical to understand um, where you're at. Um, so, you know, you have a lot of charter schools. You know, there's choice there. And, you know, you know, what we see right now is that there's a lot of foundations and booster clubs where parents and communities can come together and raise a lot of money for their schools. And so I'm wondering if you see schools that are, you know, have more low-income families, you know, they might be able to only raise $10,000 compared to other schools who can raise millions of dollars. Um, do you see those inequities? Do those create, you know, better offerings for, you know, higher-income youth? Do you see that as, um, you know, poor outcomes? Or, and also, do you feel like there's, you know, a policy approach to address inequities that way? No, actually, um, we're not really seeing that. But I know you said it was a hypothetical. I think that would actually be good, right? So I feel like you shouldn't hold it against a school if they're able to raise more money than another one. Um, I think what's good in Louisiana is that it's equitable funding across the board. So again, as I said earlier, charter schools get the exact same amount <laughs> as traditional public schools. And I think the good thing is that um, 
when you're looking for resources and it helps folks to be very creative, they go to philanthropy, they go to um, entities to try to help fund and try to help offset some costs. I think the biggest thing in Louisiana, we've gotten such a, a great outpouring of love and compassion and really like real dollars from philanthropy groups all around the nation, a lot because of Katrina. Now, 10 years in, what we're trying to push for is our own to invest in ourselves, right? We have to like invest in ourselves. It can't just keep being folks coming, you know, goodwill type of thing, right? So we have like a large, robust oil and gas industry, and, you know, we give so many tax breaks, but what we have to start doing, I believe, is that using those taxes to really funnel right back into schools because for, I think, what might be a minuscule amount to the bottom line of oil and gas would be a huge boon to our schools. And so I look at it as like being smart in those type of investments, but I don't begrudge anyone for maybe be able to have more access and be able to get more resources than another. I think that competition is good, and we wouldn't look to regulate that. Another question? Yeah. Uh, my name is Rob Nos. I'm a new state representative from southeast Portland. And I, I think in the interest of full disclosure here, for people who don't know who I am, uh, I'm a very proud union activist. Uh, I believe that teachers' unions are not the problem in this state with regard to education. All right, but I'm actually not going to ask a question about that. So I think what you're doing in New Orleans is very intriguing, where every, every school is a charter school, and that is, that is very intriguing to me, and I'm glad you're here talking about that. Here's what I'm curious about with regard to both of your states. In this state, in 1990, we passed a ballot measure, Ballot Measure 5, that radically reduced what property taxes go to the, to the schools and shift the funding in exchange for property tax relief to the state of Oregon. And over the course of the 25 years that we have lived under Ballot Measure 5 passed in 1990, we have seen, you know, basically our students, K through 12, lose three weeks of school, a year's worth of school overall, over the course of their academic journey from K through 12, all right, over the lifetime of their education, okay? And so I'm wondering, what is the school funding situation in your states? Because we are one of the bottom feeders in the United States. We think we're so progressive in Oregon, right? We're so green, we're so cool, we got Portland, we're so hip, right? But like, you know, to pick on a state that's near and dear, close to your neck of the woods, right? We're actually funding, you know, kind of like Mississippi in terms of what we do in education. And we are sandwiched between Washington, which has Seattle and all the things that that generates, right? And, of course, the great state of California, which is a huge economic engine, all right? And so from where I sit, I don't really think the teachers' union is the big problem in this state, all right? It's really that we don't invest properly with the tax structure in this state, and we haven't since 1990. And so I'm curious about what's going on in your states in terms of the level of investment compared to mine. Great. All right. Yeah. I, I, I'll go first. Can we maybe so, talk dollars per student? Yeah, so the, the dollars per student, we get, I believe, is, we're right at about almost 10000 per student in Louisiana. Um, but I think the, the, the bigger question around this is, what's really our return of investment? Okay, and I was just sharing with a few people earlier today, we haven't done any ROI type studies that I know um, on education. And so there's a, a professor at Georgetown, Marguerite Rosa, who studies ROI. And the bottom line of it is this, we, we put a lot of money in K-12 education. But we never really follow the money to say, okay, was this a smart investment? Because he did use the word about like our tax investment. And so for me, it's not about more money right now. I mean, you always want more money. But I think our schools, our charters, particularly in this autonomous situation, it's, it's that they're looking at, okay, we have the resources that we have. Now, how do we most efficiently and effectively use these? And then, and then, and then at, as we're improving, yes, you always want more. I mean, don't get me wrong. You always want to try to use more and be able to gain more. So we want to be able to push for moderate increases and, 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 and be able to do that. But I think more of it is like how efficiently and how effectively are we using exactly what we have in order to go forward. 
Now, I don't disagree with that, right? Like, we could certainly be better, and we spend a lot of time, I think, in this state trying to figure out how to use these resources better. But when we were, like, 48 or 49 in terms of the school year, in terms of the seat time that our students have, like, I feel like that is a more fundamental problem, all right, than our teachers' unions, all right, or that, you know, poverty, for that matter, is also a more fundamental but, problem. But I think and sometimes, and what our charters do, and I say charters, I mean, you could just, it's just schools. But they have freedom. So when they look at it and say, okay, I need to be able to teach another hour a day because of where my kids are at. Then you look at your budget and you say, you know what, I got to make a difference. So what I'm going to do is, one charter network, they decided they weren't going to contract out with any food service provider that couldn't offer full-time hours as well as benefits because they knew that a lot of the parents worked for these entities and they wanted the parents to be able to work with their kids in the afternoon and evenings. And what they did was pull some other schools together and consolidate it so they could drive down costs. And then realize the savings from having a better service contract and a better transportation contract can get you that extra hour in the day. I mean, when you're sitting down, it's like running a, it's like running a business. And the difference is, the difference is you're not trying to run a business for a district of 40,000 kids, you're looking at like the 1,000 kids, as we said in one of the other questions earlier, that I'm focused on. And so it's, it could be like literally almost back of the napkin. Okay, I got to adjust this. I got to get this. This is what the budget looks like. Now, how can I still get these kids to move another grade level? And that's what it's all about. Because at the end of the day, you know, I grew up in a household and my father, and they just figured out a way to make it work. And we didn't say, well, we don't have enough money, you can't go to school. I was thankful for Pell Grants. I figured out a way to make it work with what we had. And most of us in here, that's how we did. It didn't matter that we say, oh, we don't have enough. We just sit down, we figure it out if you want it bad enough. And so I just look at it with our schools. They figure it out based off what they have, and they're going to continue to work towards that. And I just feel like we can always get more, but let's just work with what we have, and it's just like a no-excuses model. And that's just what we've been doing. In California... Um, Proposition 98 was enacted at the ballot box by voters several years ago, and basically almost half the state budget goes to education. Uh, that's almost half of the California budget, so that's a pretty big budget. Um, just recently, the voters did enact Proposition, I forget what the number was, uh, but basically it was a temporary, it's probably going to be extended, uh, tax increase to put into investment in California, primarily schools and education. It's, to me though, we're always gonna want more money, but ultimately, I believe it's not about money. I really do believe it. it's not about money. Because even in looking at California with half the state budget, it's a civil rights issue. Because even when the money flows from the state, and we removed it from property taxes under Serrano v. Priest, because you've got the very wealthy and then the very poor. And so property taxes, that's out. But since Serrano v. Priest, we've had Reed, we've had all kinds of lawsuits. Even when the money flows from California, you still find it goes into the district and then depending upon, and this is where the con contracts matter, language matters, collective bargaining matters. How are you able then, and this is in California, I don't know about Oregon, but I would suspect it's probably not that much different. There's a way that money flows that is less than equitable and far less than equal. So that money is oftentimes wrapped up in personnel and that's where you find the experience, the flow of money into more affluent, easier to staff schools, avoiding uh, poor and low income uh, children. So you find these kinds of issues that are going on, the rules of the game as, a, as opposed to the overall investment. I do believe, and I would fight for more money, but this is where I think, for me at this point, if I'm going to support more money in the system, remember I'm a psychologist by training, if you keep doing the same thing in the same way, that's, and it doesn't change, that's insanity. So the only thing that I will do now is to say, I will raise money for schools, I will fight for the tax increases, I will fight for more money, but it's got to be linked to accountability. It's got to be linked to reforms. You have to show me, as Patrick said, what's the return on the dollar? Because just to pour money into the same system with the same contract, the same rules, I'm going to get the same outcome. And so the inequities don't close, they continue to grow. So I think more money, yes, but only when it's linked to 
an accountability factor. And that's the type of money I think more so that, you know, it could be a win-win. That's the power of teachers unions to say, we're willing to step up to the plate. We will go ahead and count for better evaluations, holding some part of our promotion and retention to some portion of looking at student outcome data. I mean, we shouldn't be afraid of how well we perform in a classroom. And so I think when we do that, I think we can win the public in terms of saying, I'll pay for more, but only if I get a reform on the other end. And I think that would be fair. Hillary, one more question. Okay, this is the last question. Well, before I get to my question and answer, I, I want to tell you that you make me feel good. And, and, <laughs> and, and I, I hope that when, when you get done with my answer, that the two of you can share with everyone how you feel about what you're doing to maybe inspire others in positions similar to yours to experience how you feel. But my question to the gentleman from Louisiana, you know, when I was a, a school activist for many years, I, I found the opposition of the status quo, the establishment telling me that I'm anti-school, I just want to destroy the public school system, shut them all down, and et cetera, et cetera, and I have no alternative. Of course, my alternative was things like you are experiencing now. But I'm a curious fellow. And so before tonight, I went and Googled your, your fine experience down there and found critics, naysayers, uh, about what you got going on there. And, and I saw a, a lot of rhetoric lambasting you for what you're doing. And but what I didn't see was an alternative. And I, I wonder, when you hear it down there, it, it's almost a role reversal. Because now you have the establishment people doing what basically I have done here in Oregon, but I always had an alternative. Theirs, apparently, is to go back the way it was. So share with me how you're perceiving the establishment uh, of yesterday and what they're saying. And then please share with us how you both feel on a personal level. So it's something that, um, you know, having grown up in New Orleans and I actually work outside of New Orleans more than being there. And probably as I've been talking tonight, you know, I have horrible non-regional diction and I sound like I'm just where I'm from, from New Orleans. And um, I think, you know, the, the critics are going to be the critics. And you hit it right on the head. Like, if they're not bringing solutions, I try not to even take it personal, even though they're like personal attacks. Um, people even, you know, at, at one time early on, they, they, they questioned my, my blackness, to be quite honest. Oh, you're just a figurehead. You're, you're Uncle Tom. And like, even like some of my compadres who we don't agree philosophically is like, well, no, that's one thing Patrick's not. And so I think the biggest thing is that I think when people stop complaining and stop criticizing, then I'll get worried. Because what that does, it keeps us on our toes. It keeps us thinking about what can we do next? How can we improve? Because a lot of the criticisms are valid. Um, some of the things we did, as I mentioned earlier, we did to the community, not with the community. So I just put together, me and my team put a process this year together when we had buildings that weren't assigned for school assignments, I did a community process. And even with, a vet, even with a community process that was transparent, where we put the rubrics online, made very clear about what the, the criteria was, they still said, oh, the fix was in, or Dobo did this, and then you, you can't win. Or you didn't define community right. You like picked the community that you wanted to be the community, but that's not really representative of the community. So I'm like, you know what? At the end of the day, it's, um, you know, it's like they're having a song, a reggae song. You can please some people sometime, but you can't please all the people all the time. And so for me, as I just learned not to take it personal, I'm humbled to be able to be in this position, but I'm also learning to be thick-skinned enough but still keep like a sensitive heart because if I don't love the people, I can't serve the people. And so for me, it's about keeping that love of children and keeping the love of what I'm doing. And, you know, I, I, I get inspired. I, I get more inspired when I leave Louisiana I'll tell you, when I came here, it was like heavy because we got a lot going on. And Lori saw me today, and they saw me today. I was like just working my phones. I got a crisis after crisis seemed like happening, and things just not going smoothly right now. But then when I come here and I get the questions, or people like, man, I read about what y'all are doing, that like re energizes me. So that flight back, I'm going to be like on fire. I'm going to be ready to go because it's like, thank you. Yeah. Because I realize it's, it's bigger than what we're doing down there. Like, like, like literally, like, not only the nation, but the world is watching. And it just matters. And at the end of the day, and I go back to Brene Brown, like, she's been, like, really helpful for me, just, like, like, being able to deal with being vulnerable 
and being able to understand, like, don't have all the answers. You know, going to miss more than we hit. But at the, at the end of the day, like, I try, and my team is trying. And so that's how I'm able to deal with it and, you know, just want to keep pushing through that and just keep really, like, in, in, enjoying the moment because this is just going to be a flash, right? And then it's going to be somebody else's turn. So I just really want to be thoughtful, be compassionate, and continue to move the level forward. Absolutely. I share Patrick's sentiments as well. I think you have to be an optimist to, to be in the world of education and reform. Because when you're talking about education, it ain't just about little school children. You're talking about money and politics and monopolies and status quo and... Uh, I mean, it, it's much bigger than that. Education, you know, the image of the little red brick house, it's much more complicated than that. So I look at it, and, and yeah, like Patrick, too, I mean, I've been called every name in the book. It's like, you know what, bring it on. So I think that it's important to not just fight the old status quo. It's building. It's like, as Patrick said, I know what you're against. What do you stand for? And I think that for all of us, and probably many of you in this room, and I know many of the representatives, you know, Best, you know, Julie and others, it's sort of saying, what is the vision? What do we want? And it's sort of beginning to pivot away. And, and within the, from a political standpoint, within the Democratic Party, this is a real debate that's going on now. It's not just saying we're going to defend the pillars of status quo. We're beginning to pivot and to say what kind of an education system will, do we want to build? Given that we would have the ability to think outside the box, to envision a future, to design something from scratch to the present, I doubt we're going to pick the model from feudalism. I mean, that's the past. There is a present. In Louisiana, it was brought about because of a hurricane. It was realized because of a hurricane. We're not going to wait for that. But I think what happened there inspired us to really get our systems together. And I, I look at it, and you know, I always remember, you know, it's, you know, forget the names that I've been called. My mother had a sixth grade education. But she fought so that each of her children would have education. Because she always said, it's what lifts you out of poverty. It's the path to the American dream. And when I fight, and and, and do the work that I do, after having left the legislature, I will see parents just like my mother who are fighting for their kids just like my mother fought for me. So the fight isn't over. The dream is not vanquished. People and parents can still dream. And anybody who wants to move that clock forward, it's, you know, let's move it forward. Take on what we have to take on, but really it's pivoting to start building what we imagine we can do. And that, to me, I think is the, the part that makes me feel good. I feel optimistic because I really do sense, as I see California and across the nation, people are pivoting to say, we want something better. We want to move the clock forward. And, and I believe that's happening in Oregon. It's not easy. It's not going to happen overnight. It hasn't happened in 10 years. But... It's getting better, and I think it's having the, you know, as you say, the audacity to envision, dream, and then roll up your sleeves and make it happen. All right. Well, that was a wonderful discussion. I want to thank both, both of you for being here uh, with us, and I want to turn it over to Representative Julie Parrish now, who gets the final word.